Uh, hello, everybody. Go ahead and get started here, I think. Yeah, so uh, this is my talk on extending Zephyr at runtime. Um, many of you probably know me, but if not, I'm Tom, Tom Burdick. I work at Intel Corporation. Um, so what is LEXT? Uh, and I'm, I'm going to name it. I know it's an acronym. It is an acronym, Linkable Loadable Extensions. Uh, but when you look at the, the name, I want you to think about uh, Lloyd the Llama uh, from, from Wikipedia and uh, all the double L's that come along with it. Uh, we were having a great talk yesterday about uh, what is a Zephyr subsystem. Well, Lex is a Zephyr subsystem, uh, and there's many of those. But it, it's also an ELF loader, uh, also another fun acronym, uh, executable and linkable format. But uh, maybe, maybe another kind of way to put it is it's a toolbox to, to build and manage and load ELFs in a particular way. What's an ELF? I mean, I think a lot of us know, but uh, this is a kind of a fun graphic. Uh, you know, it, it's a file format. We've got headers, sections, uh, section headers. Uh, but kind of some key elements in this are, you know, we have uh, blocks of code, uh, you know, instructions, ARM instructions, extends instructions, x86 instructions, whatever we're target we're building for. We've got uh, data. Some, some of it's, you know, constant data, constant strings. Some of it's read-write data. Some of it's, you know, the better save space data, right, where it just expands at runtime and uninitialized. <clears throat> so kind of going back to what is, what is Lex, right? Um, and uh, it's an extension manager. And so, you know, to, to manage these loadable <laughs> runtime extensions, we need, we need to have something. Um, and uh, we have a couple of nice functions to do that, load and unload. Uh, finding symbols in, in, in our ELFs. Uh, we keep a list of these extensions in memory and some, some sort of like key structure elements here that we want to kind of keep in mind as part of what we're doing and managing these things. We have a name uh, and a use count. Hmm, interesting. Uh, but there's some other fun members in here that we're going to get to. So Lex is also a memory manager. Um, and uh, memory is actually really important for these extensions as as it turns out, <laughs> and it has a dedicated heap. Um, we have, you know, read-write memory. Uh, we have executable memory, and uh, these these things all kind of need to be uh, set up in a way where you know we can actually go run things that we want to run uh, the way we want to run them. <clears throat> so in order to do that, we we need to kind of set, uh, you know. All right, we have our .text section or our ELF. We have our data section. Um, text is, you know, full of executable code. Uh, by default, when we when we load Zephyr, um, we, we our only our initial .text is, is executable. Uh, so we need to do something there, possibly. Uh, you know, we need to kind of like copy our our data, our our initialized data into read-write memory, um, so we can actually use it. We need to expand out. Our better safe space, you know, description uh, in our ELF. It's not actually in there. We just have a section size and our read-only data. Mm -hmm. So, right when we uh, when we load all this stuff up initially in Zephyr, uh, without there's just kind of two options that we can do. Uh, today we can either uh, enable, you know, if we have our MPU or MMU enabled, uh, we we need uh, user space enabled. Or we can just not use uh, any sort of hardware memory protection. The big part of that is, OK, well, if, if we would like to actually execute code in an extension and you know, jump to a random address, basically we just load our ELF file. We copy things in, maybe, uh, somewhere in there. And I say, oh, jump to you know, my hello world function. Uh, what's going to happen by default is there's going to be an exception because that part of memory is not executable. Um, so we can deal with that by either, again, disabling memory protection entirely or enabling user space and doing a lot of what Daniel was talking about in his last talk. If you were here for user space by setting up memory partitions and a memory do domain, uh, and part of that is you, you do get the you know, option to set up memory permissions in terms of like read, write, and execute. <clears throat> so there's different you know, ways we can execute uh, that code in, in an extension, I mean, it's 
random code. Maybe we picked it up off the internet. So hopefully not. Um, <laughs> but you know, if, if we don't have, um, if, if we want to run things in kernel space, um, any thread can can call in there. Uh, again, you know, assuming that you've either disabled your memory protection hardware or you've enabled user space. Even if your thread is in kernel space, you still need to use uh, user space to, to be able to manipulate those memory permissions and set up those memory regions or pages. <clears throat> yeah, and so in, in, in user space execution, this is kind of interesting, you know, like let's say we want to try and sandbox our extension that we've loaded. Uh, so we do have, you know, our MPU enabled, our MMU enabled. Um, and in a way, you know, we're kind of uh, creating a process, kind of like a Unix process. Um, we can't touch, you know, our kernel memory at all. Uh, we can run code, but we can't actually touch any kernel data. Um, but we can still run, you know, all the new things that we've just loaded in, our, our data, our better safe space, our BSS, our RO data, our text, um, which is quite nice. So we've sort of, again, created a process. So what else is LLX or Lex? <laughs> it's it's also a uh, a symbolic linker, and this is this is kind of uh, key to to actually making everything work. Um, the base firmware has, you know, uses a macro called export symbol. And if you've seen the Linux version of this, it's very similar. It creates a uh, a section um, in, in in your linker script with a sorted array of names and address pairs. And extensions can do the same thing in themselves with a, a slightly different macro today, uh, LL extension symbol. And so why do we need all of this stuff, right? I mean, we've, it seems like you know, we have to manage memory. We have to keep track of uh, a mapping of names to, sim you know, names to addresses. And, and really, this all comes down to this is all needed just to simply get to hello world. Uh, and that is because elves have relocations. And these relocations allow you to place that dot text anywhere in memory, uh, in, in our case, right? So you can load your dot text anywhere that you've allocated it. Um, but it, to be able to do that, you know, your, your executable code needs to know where to find things. Uh, find uh, variables, let's say, in your dot data or RO data section. Find functions that haven't yet been defined in itself. So we get relocations like this when we see our sort of basic hello world extension, we have uh, you know an RO data uh, address to the string that we want to print, um, and we have a you know an undefined reference to symbol print k. So when we actually go to to load this extension, we need to look at this elf and see these relocations and rewrite them uh, with with the actual address uh, of these things, right? Uh, either objects in memory or symbolic references to functions. <clears throat> so what are some key points about these, these relocations? The, you know, the kinds of re relocations that are going to show up are architecture dependent. As we kind of saw here, this is specific to ARM, but there's actually you know, relocations specific to each architecture. And it also depends on the, uh, the ELF linkage. So as you're compiling, you, know, you can have flags to, to create relocatable objects which typically you don't see when you're compiling your normal C program. Those, those all get linked together, um, but, but we actually end up using them in, in Lex, uh, or static or shared. Also depends on, you know, some, sometimes your compiler flags can change, uh, you know, what kind of relocations show up as, uh, as Luca helped uh, solve an early issue that we ran into, right, where there was a, a, a kind of a tricky relocation to do that I didn't really want to deal with right away uh, to get to Hello World. Um, and this great compiler flag in long calls. So you only get uh, absolute address trumps, which has made things quite a bit easier. And that kind of gets into the next point here where these, these relocations do require, um, at times, you know, it's not always simply like, hey, I have an address, my string is over here. A lot of times they are instructions, uh, instructions for moves, instructions for the loads, instructions for branch and links. And those instructions are encoded in a particular way for that particular architecture. So in order to update them with the appropriate address, you have to decode that particular architecture's opcode, change a part of it, and then re-encode it, uh, which 
I think uh, <laughs> Cedric did a great job adding uh, many of the ARM ones, which is very, very quite nice. So, um, and you know, some of these, some of these jump codes, uh, some of these op codes require uh, PC relative addressing. So, if if we kind of look at uh, you know some some function call that that might be in your extension, going from one one function to another, a lot of times these are program counter dependent to keep them small. So you don't always have to store a 32-bit address right in your instruction. Um, so you know, you know, if you're using ARM Thumb or Extensa, right, you have a 16-bit opcode per perhaps. Um, you only get so many bits to store an address relative to your PC. And that, again, makes it a little trickier to do. If you can imagine for a moment if that, uh, that address to that function is too far away for that particular opcode to represent now you need to create a jump table. And that's exactly why the in long call, you know, kind of saved the day initially, right? I didn't want to have to go create a jump table. <clears throat> yeah, so kind of continuing on with some key points about relocations here. Um, these sections can be very interdependent. Um, you know, text obviously needs data. Your, your, your instructions obviously need data. But data can actually need other data as well. And so each, each kind of, uh, each section that you have in your ELF file has an associated section typically with, uh, with these relocation instructions associated with it. it symbolic linking at, at the moment, you know, kind of requires a, um, like binding print K. We have a table, it's, it's sorted, uh, but today it is a linear search of string comparisons, which can take some time. Uh, I think as Cedric noted in his talk, um, you know, it took quite some time to, to load uh, some of the ELFs. So this is maybe one of these cases where we could do a better job in the future. So loading an ELF at a high level, what does this, what does this actually mean? Well, we, we read the ELF file, we check out the headers, we look at the sections, maybe we copy some of them, maybe we reference some of them. Um, real, reallocate, you know, relocations are applied, those instructions are applied to, to rewrite opcodes or rewrite addresses, so everything looks pretty and it looks as if you know, we knew where everything was to begin with, although we didn't. And finally, the, the extension is added to a global list, and at long last, you know, symbols in our extension, functions, objects, can finally be referenced. We can use them, we can call into them, we can look at them. Um, so how do we actually build one of these? Kind of a great, uh, you know, a, a quick little sample here. Um, you know, when I, when I started first doing this, it was, it was very nice to just be able to call the compiler directly and do object dumps and kind of see all of this, this ELF data. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's still quite nice to be able to do this manually. Um, again, to sort of experiment and tinker and as you're looking, uh, as at least as I was looking at these relocations and trying to understand it all better, uh, this was a quick and easy way to do it without having to, to involve um, all of CMake. But uh, since then, uh, Luca has uh, done a great job adding some CMake functions that, that make all of this very, very simple. Uh, looks pretty much just like adding, you know, a library target in, in Zephyr. And you can give it a name, sources, output, easy. Uh, I kind of want to give um, one more, you know, let's, let's take this to the next level, though, and talk about uh, this great PR by Ederson, um, adding an EDK. So let's say we want to go a step further with our extensions. We don't want to just build them in the same tree as our application. We want to package up sort of a, a little development kit uh, based on our base firmware. We, we create our own API, maybe include some of Zephyr APIs, and now we want to pass along not our whole firmware, not our whole firmware source, but just a little part of it, a little, you know, a box of headers, CMake files, and so on that we can give to somebody else, and they can build extensions for themselves that we can load. Uh, so that's exactly what this, this, this PR does. It adds some great tooling to do exactly that. Yeah, so what are, uh, <laughs> what are some use cases for, for today, maybe tomorrow? Um, you know, I, I think uh, many of these are, are kind of hopefully clear, but, uh, it, you know, there's, there's a, we can use them for plugins. So if we have, you know, firmware that does audio, video, or sensing, uh, processing, we can create plugins to our pipeline of processing steps. Uh, we can also create, you know, isolated and updatable processes. So if we have, uh, you know, a device and we want to be able to run multiple 
pieces of firmware on that, that single device, but have different sort of sandboxes that each one can play in, we can do that. We can create multi-tenant firmware uh, based on a base image with the EDK involved. Very quite, you know, quite nice. Um, potentially, you know, we can, we can also have sort of a, a base firmware um, with all our drivers, with all of our logging, everything sort of there. And, you know, and we want to reload quickly. Uh, we could potentially, you know, keep, let's say, 90% of the firmware, you know, running in memory and unload and load sort of a main loop that's, that's nice and small. Um, if we look at Arduino and their sketches, I imagine that's uh, quite a useful case. Um, and, and perhaps drivers. Uh, you know, if we, if we kind of look at how Linux kernel works with Linux kernel modules, there's, there's possibly uh, a use case here to, to, to load and unload drivers in cases where, you know, your hardware might vary. Uh, maybe we can keep a lot of our code, you know, some of our larger drivers on flash and load them in memory as, as needed depending on the board configuration. So, right, what are some caveats? I mean, this is relatively new. Um, well, uh, there's no built-in signing mechanism today, so you can load any code uh, that you build. Uh, there's no restriction on it today. That's sort of left up to you. Uh, it's a framework to build on top of. Uh, debugging is uh, an interesting story. I mean, you can debug at an assembly level. For Hello World, that's pretty straightforward. You're not, you're looking at, you know, a small little page of assembly. Um, otherwise, you do need to kind of load the symbols, and that can be a bit cumbersome. As noted, uh, <clears throat> you know, before, you know, if you have uh, sort of kernel objects, you know, with this can be a little bit tricky as well because some kernel objects, especially when you enable user space, want to, want to live in a particular location in your memory uh, at build time. That's used for, you know, perfect hash function. So when you pass your kernel object in through a syscall, it, you know, it, it, it effectively uses the address of that uh, and throws it into a perfect hash, hash function to verify things. That doesn't exist if you try to statically declare, say, a mutex or a semaphore in your extension and then go ahead and use user space with it. It's, it's not going to, you know, it's going to fail in a, a fun and not so fun way. <clears throat> Lastly, I mean, there, you know, there's a couple other things, right? Uh, di dictionary logging is, is kind of a how do we do this uh, today? Not a great answer. So some missing puzzle pieces there. Uh, execute in place is not supported today. As you saw, we need to load all these things into memory to, to, to apply these relocations, these relocation instructions that are associated with each section. That means we have to manipulate all of that stuff uh, in read-write memory in RAM. And probably the, you know, the, one of the, you know, the things that I, I really kind of look forward to or, or am trying to, to work on uh, probably next is, is the, uh, at least having some, some stability in terms of ABI and, and syscall guarantees. Each time we build today, the syscall ID has changed. So if you, were to, you, know, if you did want to use user space with this and solely user space with this, uh, you have to be pretty careful not to uh, change your base firmware build where it will, will change the syscall IDs. Um, it would be nice if those syscall IDs remain the same. Uh, going a step further, kind of creating an ABI would be quite nice. So you could load firmware, um, you know, you could update your base firmware and, and keep your extensions uh, the same without having to rebuild them necessarily. So I, I do kind of want to point out that uh, this, this was not, you know, solely me. This was uh, quite a few people um, over time making this. And I think that's a real testament to open source. Uh, you know, prior to me, there was a PR for an elf loader by a former Intel employee. Uh, Luca at Arduino added uh, a lot of great RMV7 and, and CMake tooling. Um, one of my colleagues in the Sound Open Firmware project added extensive support and, and uh, dynamic uh, shared, you know, uh, sorry, shared elf linking support uh, with PLCs and global offset tables and things of that nature. Um, yeah, and uh, Cedric and Benjamin has a great, I don't know if Benjamin's in the crowd, but if you, if you look on LinkedIn and you search for Lex and uh, and Zephyr, you'll see an awesome demo by, uh, B by Benjamin Cade uh, with LVGL involved where it loads and unloads various GUI modules. Um, it's really quite something. So, um, yeah, and I kind of just glued it all together, to be honest. So 
Um, that's my talk. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. With us. Sorry. It's working. Uh, I'm working with a sound open format project and we have proprietary libraries. Is there any preprocessing that you need to do on the ELF or you, do you need to have the it compiled with certain flags? So yeah, I, I, you know, kind of going back to the, the relocations, right, that are, that are there, not all relocations are supported uh, for all architectures. Basically, ARM is the only one today that I believe supports all relocations and that's again thanks to Cedric um, from Schneider. I believe Giannotti from SOF has added many of the Extensa relocations, because I'm, I, hi Daniel, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about Extensa in this case, correct? Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I assume that many of the Extensa relocations are possible and, and already implemented, but if not, then that's something that, you know, would need to be done uh, to support that. Um, but really, that's, that's kind of the biggest barrier is supporting those relocations. Uh, hi, uh, fantastic talk, thank you. Uh, question about the architecture support. I guess that right now it's Cortex-M plus Extensa or anything else? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So uh, there, there is like a, an architecture hook today. I think it's, it's probably, um, it will probably need to be refined somewhat as time goes on, depending on like what kind of parameters need to go in there. Um, but yeah, today it's, it's, it's Cortex-M and, uh, and Extensa. All right. And for the, the build process, because you mentioned you, mm, that there is a PR with the, the uh, let's say, SDK. Mm -hmm. uh, what? EDK, sorry. Uh, so do you, uh, do you build your extensions against your application so that all the memory limitations are taken into account or do you build it separately? What, what's the process? Yeah, so it, it, dep it depends on the, the route you want to go. So if you're, you can use the built-in like uh, CMake functionality, right? If, if you have your base for, you know, you have your Zephyr application, you could use that to build extensions right in line, right next to your application. If you want to build outside of your main application, that's exactly what uh, Ederson's development kit, the, you know, or extension development kit is, uh, is there for, um, to do exactly that. You can, you can, Effectively, there's a new target added uh, to, to the CMake target list, right? In your base application, you, you build the, the, the Lex EDK. It generates, uh, I believe, a directory, right? Or maybe a tarball. One of those. <laughs> One of the, yeah, effectively, so, some sort of like directory or tarball that you can basically you know, package up and give, uh, give out. And that's all you would need then at that point uh, to go and build, um, besides you know, the, the compiler tool chain and, and such, right? Uh, but that was, that's all you would need to, to go and build a, an extension at that point. It includes all the headers, CMake, compiler flags, uh, and, and so on, yeah. So yeah, I was, I, what are the thoughts on um, like ecosystem directions for like complicated dependencies? I'm thinking about things that want to link, link to like libc++ and you know, the libraries going on and on and on, often with transited dependencies. Um, I, you know, like obviously, one could force apps to sit there and make a static library out of everything they're going to depend on. Um, is is there hope to to handle some of this in a uh, you know kind of like the HAL directory that we have right now? You know, something where there's like a repository of like pre-done uh, uh, integrations. Yeah, po po I mean, possibly. Like the there's there's no real limit on it today in terms of. Um, so, so I, I don't know if I said this, but extensions, uh, I believe today can, it can depend on other extensions. If, if it's not today, that is a planned feature um, by others and myself. Um, so, so you could have, you know, like kind of the equivalent of a shared library. Uh, so if, if you kind of have that going on, right, like I think, uh, Cedric, you, you were talking about CanOpen, uh, which is quite large, or maybe you have a library of, of, of plugins for your particular firmware. Maybe it's audio, maybe it's sensing, maybe it's imaging, right, image processing. Um, I think that would be great. I, I think that's sort of outside of the scope of, of Zephyr mostly, um, right? I mean, that's sort of application dependent um, and, and how your embedded application wants to work. But I mean, certainly that's possible. In terms of relocations, I know it's not a a complete solution, but could um, position independent executables help the situation? 
They probably could. Yeah, I haven't looked too deeply into those. So you know, I, I understand that yes, they can. Um, there's there's sort of a cost, uh, uh, you know, out of that as I understand it though, because you have to you know pay like a register cost to keep keep around like what position you're in. Um, you have to just sort of load things in a particular place. Then as as I again as I understand it, I'm not you know I haven't looked too deeply into this. So tell me if I'm wrong, but. Um, yeah, so I, I believe there's some cost to that, uh, and that's sort of true. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I said this as well, but there's, that's sort of true uh, depending on how you do elf linkage as well. So if you do relocatable uh, elves, you sort of get like the best possible outcome potentially uh, in terms of instruction, like size and and and, uh, and and speed, because you're not doing additional loads and stores for like, hey, I need the address to print K. Well, I mean, as you saw, there was a separate you know, address right in the text section. It had to go load that, then call to it. Um, if, if you were to do the, you know, if you were to just build this normally, it'd, it'd be a single instruction of BL, here's the address, PC relative, go jump there, right? Yeah. Um, uh, second question is around executing place support. Does it sound reasonable to do the relocation at the time you're saving the extension to the flash? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it's quite possible. You could, you know, if you knew, I think it, like anything is possible, of course, right? But um, the way it is today, it's all it's all very much dynamic. But you could possibly have like fixed slots, so you, you do like relocation for for everything ahead of time, knowing that you're going to load that particular extension in a particular place in memory. But that's sort of the, the you know the problem, right? You have to know where everything's going to be uh, ahead of time to do those relocations in Flash. Um, Potentially, you know, I, I had thought about, you know, maybe, maybe you could um, basically go, you know, this is co costly, right? But maybe you could do it where you, you read in your your elf, knowing where you're going to put it, rewrite it, uh, in in Flash, saving it back, uh, only loading the, the, you know, the read write portions, and then execute from Flash, still potentially saving like the te the text section, right, and and the the read only, uh, data section. You still have to pay the cost of the data though. So, I mean, there's some options. There's some options, yeah. Um, in Zapier, I understand the, the build is application-driven, which means I take my application and build a single binary with everything. Yes. And this, is, this doesn't really play well with our current build system and our workflow. I was wondering if this could potentially become a way to disaggregate and decouple my application and drivers from, um, uh, you know, binary that encapsulates all the Zephyr kernel and uh, other things, or am I taking it too far? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think that's like, a, you know, a, a different problem. Uh, unless you're talking about, you know, you want to segregate uh, your application into to things that you want to load and unload at runtime. Uh, I think building, you know, these things as, as like separate libraries that then link together at the end is a, is a separate issue, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, on the you know on the point about setting the addresses when you flash the the, the, the app, you actually have a two-way problem, right? Because if uh, you had something on the slide there about the different user domains, I guess, or usage domains, so one of the f them that you want to be able to update independently is the it, it would be like the host kernel OS, right? And so those addresses may change too. They might. Um, and and, but I think what's what what's interesting to think about though is on some of the like the the various like loadable libraries that you see in in Linux and things like that 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 they they'll have approaches where you can uh, at load time they might update all the addresses or at runtime they have that special little thing they jump off to a little function they figure out what the address is, update it. The second time you go through the function or the thing, it doesn't have to do that because it's already patched it or whatever. Um, so those are like all these little interesting little tricks to consider. But I think you have to deal with the fact that if you once you have these loadable modules, you're going to be in a situation where you also want to be able to load anything in there and be able to fix up any of the addresses. I think you're right. Um, yeah, and it's... It, it could be like again, it's a it's a, a framework or a toolkit to to build on top of or or, or change to to suit your particular needs, right? 
Um, I work at Intel, so you know I, I've I've tried to to focus on Intel problems in this, um, and that's that's you know, I'm I'm very happy to see outside contributors because it does sort of expand the use case. Uh, but absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's there's going to be some fun things you can do and some very tricky things you can do uh, regarding this, right? Yeah. So, great talk. This stuff is is really cool. There's a couple of questions with the extensibility and you know you keep describing this as a framework from a security perspective so i guess the first question is like with code signing is it possible to patch in some sort of function where you verify before you allow the load to proceed and then following uh, the load finishing and the patching of every address is it possible to have a, a function that you hook in afterwards to do something like reconfigure your mpu to now make that region and ram uh, execute only, you know, you can't modify it. Yeah, so, um, I mean, really, you're entirely in control of the, the flow of things. So the, there's, you know, there's a function to load, um, but that's that's something that your application can call in any context it wants, right? There's a there's a sample, the shell the shell loader, where you, you can dump in a hex, a hex dump of one of these elves, and it'll, it'll load, and you can then call, you know, call out to a symbol. Um, but that, that, there's nothing that says that's the only flow that's that's there. You can you can absolutely you know check um, be, you know maybe you prefix or suffix your your elf file with you know an HMAC signature of some kind, right? And you go verify, hey, this is all signed by a trusted key that I know I trust it before even you know trying to decode that it's an elf file. That's totally doable. Um, and nothing actually today, at least, nothing actually runs when you load. So the only thing that happens is you know we interpret the elf file. We, we, we copy data, we do the relocations, and we provide a symbol table that your application can then uh, find a symbol in there and, and call into. So if you have you know, a particular use case where you want all of your modules to have an entry point, that's, that's entirely up to you. You could absolutely do that. You, you, maybe you had a macro like um, uh, you know, my cool firmware in it, right? I mean, Linux has this already sort of built into modules, but that's a particular use case for you know, kernel modules. Um, this is sort of like more of a, a toolkit uh, in terms of like what, what Linux kernel modules would use or even Linux user applications and shared libraries would use. Uh, so it's sort of the base of all of that. Yeah. You mentioned that part of this of Lex is kind of memory management and so forth. Can you sp speak a little bit more to kind of what the configuration there is for, for someone using this on like carving out memory for the loadable modules and, and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, today there's, there's uh, and it, it, it is a very simple model today. There's there's a single heap, right? So you can, there's a K can fit. It's a dedicated heap to Lex, but, it, but there's a single heap. Um, you, you set the size in kilobytes, and, and it, it is kilobytes because, you know, as soon as you talk about uh, enabling the MPU or MMU, uh, you're going to use some space just simply for, as, as uh, you know, in the last talk, if you're here for that, there's going to be padding for, for pages or MPU alignment. Um, so it does need to be somewhat sized to, to account for, you know, the various sections that are going to need to be allocated there. Um, but in effect, yeah, it's, it's, there's a single heap. Um, there's also an option, you know, and the, uh, the sound open firmware does use this where not all memory has to be allocated. So you don't have to allocate all, all sections from the, the extension. If you know that your extension already lives in some addressable memory that you know you can already do these sorts of like permission setting bits and and so on on yeah all right i'm gonna uh ask you about uh chre yeah android's uh contacts hub runtime environment and uh, how that differs from the solution yeah absolutely so uh you know i in fact uh just to to clarify like some sources of inspiration that i took for this one of them was chre I, I did look at that. I looked at Linux kernel modules. I looked at uh, uh, quite a few things. I looked at some linkers because it turns out you know you need to actually do linking as well. But uh, CRG does kind of a subset of what this does. So uh, it has a fixed uh, symbol table for that. So so CRG is a sort of a subset of what this does, right? There's a fixed symbol table that that it provides to uh, the nan. I think it's nano apps in this case, right? Um, but in effect, it's kind of doing all of the same things. It doesn't do um, necessarily the memory bit permission setting that I, I believe. You, you can uh, double check that, Keith, if you want. I, I don't believe it does, but 
Uh, otherwise, yeah, it kind of does the same, same song and dance in a lot of ways, but in a very specific way. Hey, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm actually giving a talk on WebAssembly later today. Um, <laughs> and there's there's a, a good amount of differences between uh, what, what you're doing there and, and the extension models here. But I was curious if you uh, looked into that at all um, and what you see as some of like the pros and cons versus the different approaches. Yeah, absolutely. I had a, uh, you know, so, someone uh, ask me exactly about WebAssembly um, and, and using this. So it was, it was kind of an interesting uh, so they, they were using both this loadable module and, and WebAssembly. Um, and we kind of talked a bit about, you know, what were the, the, the downsides of WebAssembly in this case. Um, I mean, the, the main con that, that's sort of kept, replay, you know, that, that's replaying in my mind is that uh, you don't necessarily have, at least as I understood it today, all the, the hardware acceleration extensions or even necessarily uh, all of the, the kind of one-to-one hardware um, instruction mapping, right? So, you, I mean, there's part of that, um, but there's also, you know, some, there's, there's some overhead and you have a run, you know, effectively a runtime. This has no runtime. This is, you know, you're, you're building for that target. It's, it's, you know, and it won't run, you know, WebAssembly has the, I would say that the one benefit of being um, portable across architectures, this is not, you know, this, you're, you're building for this architecture. You can use all the instructions available to you, all the hardware acceleration available to you. You mentioned kind of how we have this export symbol. Is there something like are kernel symbols exported by default, or do you, do we have to go change everything, or kind of? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I mean, so far, our export symbol has been added sort of uh, as needed by by tests and users. Uh, part of that EDK PR, or actually there was a previous PR, I believe, right, Ederson, where uh, Ederson went and added uh, as part of so any basically. Anytime uh, I believe the syscall macro is there, it's already exported for you. So uh, you know a large number of uh, Zephyr APIs are already exported. Um, I believe Giannotti, uh added a lot of the libc uh, symbols, so you, you, you know you don't necessarily have to statically compile your libc along with your extension. You can use uh, the base firmware's libc functionality. Um, but yeah, it, it sort of comes as as needed basis. Um, there's, there's possibilities, so I, I didn't really talk about that either, but there's the possibility that maybe you want to limit what symbols are you know, available to an extension, and uh, there, there is that possibility to go manipulate that part of your ELF file you know, at, at some point in your build step, uh, right, where I only want to supply like, you know, a subset of functionality to extensions to be more in align with you know, a plugin type system. Um, but yeah, today it's sort of you know as needed, and uh, if, if you need more, feel free to send a PR if, or just add them to your application. So, yeah. Uh, any more questions for Tom? Oh, yeah, there's one. <laughs> hey. I see in your presentation you said uh, maybe drivers question marks. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So that yeah, I'm, I'm glad yeah. you're asking about that. I mean. Um, yeah. Just I just told, what did you? Already look at the DTS problem because because the DTS you have all your hardware. So now if you want to add drivers dynamically, maybe it won't be in the DTS. So did you already look at that or? Yeah. So that I mean th I haven't looked at it too deep, and I you know that's kind of why there's a question mark there. But I think like again, um, if I, we go back a couple talks, right? Ederson has a great talk about deferred initialization, and I think there's a possibility there to sort of combine. Um, extensions and deferred initialization to, to be a little more than just, hey, don't run my init function right away, but possibly, uh, you know, when you run your init function, maybe that goes off somewhere and loads a, loads a, a module, possibly. But no, I haven't looked too deeply at it. Um, it it's a, you know, it's something that, you know, I'd, I'd happily accept a PR for if anyone's <laughs> interested. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, uh, anything more? All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Tom. Yep. Great talk. Absolutely. Thank you.